Welcome everyone to Holocaust Museum LA's Inside the Acid-Free Box, a monthly series where we take you behind scenes and look at some of our most beloved and cherished collections of artifacts. Um, my name is Jordana Gessler and I am the Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Holocaust Museum LA. I'm joined here with my colleague Christy who is calling in from our archive at our institution. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of us for those of you who are joining us um, in this series, welcome back. We're so thrilled to have you uh, today. We are going to be looking at a really interesting exhibition that focuses on one of the most incredible rescue missions during the Holocaust, and that is the Kinder Transport. December 1st was World Kinder Transport Day, and so we figured we would dedicate this month and do several different programs around the Kinder Transport. Um, it is very important for Holocaust Museum LA to share the stories of the survivors and honor those who perished while inspiring a more dignified and humane world. And by sharing stories that really highlight the capacity of human beings to stand up and do the right thing and work together in order to save roughly 10,000 children were rescued during the, on the kinder transports, um, I think is demonstrative of our mission and hopefully will inspire people to stand up and speak up when they see atrocities happening around them. So thank you so much for joining. I'm here with Christy. Christy, do you wanna share a few opening remarks? Um, it's great to be here. This is definitely a topic that is close to our hearts. Like Jordana mentioned, we have a traveling exhibit that uh, we host with respect to this particular um, facet of Holocaust history. Uh, and it's definitely a number of really interesting collections that we're gonna go through today. Great. Um, before we get started, for those of our guests who are joining us for maybe the first time for Inside the Acid Free Box, um, tell us a little bit about the archival collection. Yeah, so the archival collection at the museum is housed here in the room that you can see behind me, as well as within the gallery spaces downstairs in the museum. Um, we have roughly 610 collections and sub collections within our archives um, with approximately 20,000 artifacts and documents and other materials. Um, many of the collections relate to a particular person or a family and then include materials like photographs, documents, three-dimensional objects like badges, pins, textiles. And then we also have a collection of uh, Holocaust survivor testimony as well. Uh, and so a number of the artifacts and collections that we have um, relate to some of the children that were saved by the Kinder Transport, um, which we'll talk about today. And that includes collections like the Lisa Euro collection, the Rita Rimmeloa collection, and countless others. Um, you know, unfortunately, we can't go through all of them. Uh, there are a, a few that we will look at today that have some really interesting stories. Yeah, and this image that you see on your screen is part of our second gallery at the museum. So this gallery is dedicated really from 1933 to 1939 as a timeline um, of the beginning of Nazi Germany, taking us in the lead up right before World War II. And we're now looking in the, um, you can see in the corner on the left hand side, there's the word Kristallnacht, which has a huge impact on what becomes the kinder transports, which we're looking at right in front of us. You can also see a number of suitcases, um, primary sources that tell the story of these children, um, just thinking about the fact that they had to pack up their belongings in a single suitcase and say goodbye to their family members and board trains to unknown lands where they spoke foreign languages. And those are the stories we're gonna be telling today about these children who for the most part, most of them never were able to be reunited with their family as their parents perished in the Holocaust. So one of the first stories we're gonna talk about, um, oh, before we start talking about stories, my apologies, a little bit of history of the kinder transport. So here you can see kind of a map of the major um, cities that trains left from. And so these trains traveled to the UK, um, obviously stopping and then ships were taken to, to make the cross across the water. But um, all of these cities are from places that were under Nazi control. So of course, it's not just Germany. By the time we get to December 1st, 1938, which is um, the first kinder transport to leave Berlin in Germany. At that point, Austria was already annexed into Germany. And so Austrian Jews had felt the impact of Kristallnacht. And then before World War II broke out, which ultimately ended um, all the kinder transports due to borders being closed, um, between 
December of 1938 and September 1st, 1939, which was the beginning of World War II, um, the Nazis also annexed parts of what, what today we know as the Czech Republic at that time was parts of Czechoslovakia. And so you can also see that Prague, um, you could see the trains left from Prague as well. So just to understand sort of the geography that we're looking at in that map. And so in response to the brutality of Kristallnacht, which was at that point an incredibly violent evening um, of state-sponsored violence against um, German and Austrian Jews, about 30,000 Jews, Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. It's actually the single largest arrestation of German Jews in the entirety of the Holocaust. A hundred Jewish men were murdered that night. Dozens, hundreds of synagogues were burned. Um, Jewish homes were broken into. Jewish businesses were destroyed. It's actually called Kristallnacht because the next morning streets were literally littered with glass. Um, so the night of broken glass, this was an intense amount of violence. So very quickly after that violence, it was apparent to families living in Germany and Austria that if they were Jewish, their lives were in danger. Um, many of them, their husbands, fathers had already been deported to concentration camps that evening um, for no other reason except for the fact that they were Jewish and they searched for a safe haven for their kids. Um, there was a response to that in the United Kingdom with a network of different organizations and um, singular people who stood up and said, I wanna help um, take a child into the in, into the nation and kind of save them from sort of this violence and tension that we see to transpiring in Nazi Germany. No one was sure of the future, but they knew that in the moment there was increased violence and therefore children should be rescued. Um, so there were groups like um, Jewish organizations, um, refugee organizations. In fact, the, uh, the Quakers, the Quaker organization was really, really active. Many Quakers took children in. And then there were just individual humanitarians like Nicholas Winton, Sir Nicholas Winton, who was a young stockbroker who at first was going to Europe, to mainland Europe for a ski trip and just saw this desperate refugee crisis of people just trying to get their children to safety. And so he took it upon himself to organize over 660 kids to be brought to the United Kingdom and single-handedly found families to take those kids in. So about 10,000 Jewish children from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and modern day Poland were sent to the UK on kinder transports. The first train carrying refugee children left December 1st, 1938, as I mentioned, um, and the trains had to stop due to um, the outbreak of World War II. Um, but the vast majority of kids never saw their families again, unfortunately. In addition to the 10,000 kids brought to the UK, smaller kinder transports made their way to the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, and Sweden. Unfortunately for the children who were taken in in the Netherlands and Belgium, um, those are two countries that were eventually invaded by Nazi Germany. Um, but so even though the UK was not the only country to allow refugee children to come in during this time, they did allow the largest number. And so the first story we're gonna talk about is one that's very near and dear to our community. Um, so I'll let Christy introduce it a little. I know she has some documents with her and will tell us what we're looking at on our screens. Yeah, so the first story we're gonna look at is Rita Rimalua. So Rita is actually the mother of uh, our board chair, Michelle Gold, and she's also a docent at the museum. And so we have some of Rita's photographs and other things from her life. So she was born in 1924 um, to parents Phoebus and Marie, and she was one of three children. And so in the image at the top left there, you can see that's a picture of Rita with her father. Um, and then actually, Jordana, if you wanna just stop sharing just for a second, I can actually show. So this is actually a picture of um, Rita's parents, Phoebus and Marie. And so, um, as Jordana mentioned, as a result of the increasing anti-Semitism and the violence with the rise of Nazism, um, her parents realized that they needed to essentially do something um, in terms of getting their children out. So during Kristallnacht, um, Rita's father, he had a store which sold home goods like linens and um, towels and other materials as such. And it was actually looted um, during Kristallnacht and the family's home was actually vandalized. Uh, and so they really realized the danger that the, that the family was facing. Um, and they 
decided to go into hiding. We don't know a lot of time, a lot about their time in hiding um, and from conversations with Michelle as well, um, she has sort of only been able to uncover bits and pieces um, more recently about that. Um, but they managed to go into hiding for a short period of time. And actually at this time, um, so Rita did have two, two other brothers and they had both already managed to leave at that time. So her eldest brother, Harry, had escaped to South America in 1936 and her middle brother, Peter, um, was sent to Switzerland to stay with an aunt because he had actually had a car accident involving an SS officer. And uh, it was quickly decided that it was just too dangerous for him to stay. And so he was sent to Switzerland in 1938 to stay with an aunt, which is a whole other story. Um, but yeah, so the, the remaining family went into hiding for a short period of time. And Rita's parents quickly realized that it wasn't safe for Rita and that she needed to, they needed to make arrangements for her to escape as well. So they were able to secure her a place on the kinder transport. And they had actually met uh, friends uh, named the Nettlers, the Nettler family, uh, while they were holidaying. Uh, and the two families became really good friends. And actually during that time, because it was obviously prior to everything that was happening, um, but it was increasing, becoming increasingly clear that it, was, that it wasn't going to be safe for them to return. Um, the Nettlers actually tried to convince Rita's parents not to go back, and, and, but they were of the opinion that they, they thought it would be okay. Surely it's not as bad as, as all of that. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's ultimately be fine. Um, so when they returned and after the violence of Kristallnacht, um, they started to correspond with the Nettlers again and the Nettlers said that they would take Rita in to their home in Glasgow in Scotland. So Rita's parents were able to secure a place for her on the kinder transport um, and so she boarded a train to Glasgow uh, and actually was uh, picked up there by the Nettlers. So Fred um, Nettler was actually a uh, I guess you could call him very active in a lot of these organizations that were um, helping to bring Jewish children to the UK. Uh, and so this is actually a clipping of an, I don't know if you want to, yeah, of a newspaper article. And you can actually see this is Fred Nettler on the side here. And this is actually a, an article that was in the paper of, with a picture of a number of the children that came on the kinder transport to Glasgow. Uh, and Fred Nettler was instrumental in making sure that they got to their foster homes, essentially, of where they were going to stay. Um, and also, Michelle had recently discovered some documents that also included Fred's signature that indicate that he signed as a guarantor to provide the sponsorship money for some of the children um, that were coming. So I don't know, Jordana, if you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of what was required. And I'm even going to share um, here. Let me get this back. Um, just for people to understand the difficulty of these choices of families to leave their homes, even though they're facing increased violence, just for an example, Leipzig, which is where Rita was born, um, Jews have been living in Leipzig since the 12th century. There was already a synagogue established there in the 13th century. So thinking about the length and time that a, Jew a thriving Jewish community lived in this city and the roots that they had, this was an incredibly difficult decision for families to make whether or not they should leave as a family or even send their child to safety if they could not get out as a family, um, was making a decision to, to leave a home, a true home, a place where their grandparents might have been buried or their stores and businesses and homes that for generations they had lived in um, existed there. And so this was definitely a very hard decision. And I've heard Michelle on tours to students at the museum talk extensively about her mother's memories of her parents crying when they placed her on that train. And this, this real concern about if people thought they were doing the right thing or not in, in trying to save their children by splitting up a family. And for people like um, the Nettlers to open their homes and to guarantee that the children could enter the UK, you know, typically with refugee crisis, crises, it's not sort of an open border situation. There are a number of restrictions that countries put on. And so one of the restrictions the UK said is that these kids could not be a, become an economic burden on the, on the country, on the state. And so families had to guarantee, had to be guarantors. And that's what um, uh, the Nettlers did is they guaranteed that they would take on financial responsibility for these children if it came to a place where um, they were gonna become wardens of the state or come burdens on the state. And so there were a lot, many hoops um, for kids to go through. And 
Rita at least was going to a family whom she knew or had some knowledge of before she went there. Other families sent their kids to the UK not knowing where they would end up and we'll explore some of those families. But to really understand the separation and loss that was transpiring, we wanna highlight a few postcards. And this is an incredible story. I mean, Michelle Gold, who's a board member and doesn't the museum, one day was basically just Googling her name um, or her mother's name as we all often do, um, Googling ourselves to see what comes up. And she found that there was a collection of postcards at the um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC that had her mother's name attached to them. And she had no idea what these were. Um, it had already been since after her mother had passed and she reached out to the museum and learned that there had been a collection found sometime after the war, not quite sure where, um, bought at an auction of World War II related material and donated to a Holocaust museum because the postcards proved to be about the Holocaust. And these are a series of postcards written by Michelle's mother Rita as a young teenager living in the UK, writing to her aunt and uncle who were in Switzerland, we mentioned them earlier, with the hope that they could be passed to her parents. And you can see just some um, quotes from these, but these notes are so heart-wrenching when you just think about the pain of separation this child was in, not knowing the fate of her parents, not knowing the fate of the world, not knowing if she would ever see her parents again, and just longing for not only to hear some news from her parents, but for her parents to know how much she loved them um, and cherished them. And you can see here's a, a quote, I'm sitting in my room at the moment with your photograph in front of me. You're both smiling on it and I'm hoping to God that he watches over you and makes sure you keep your wonderful smiles. They mean so much to me. Every time when I'm not feeling too happy, I go and look at your photographs and it is those you take me into your arms and comfort me. Um, and so oftentimes when we talk about the kinder transport, we kind of end with, oh, and then the kids went and were rescued and saved and sent to the UK but it doesn't mean that their trials and tribulations were anywhere near over or done. For the remainder of the war, they, had, they barely had any news of their parents. They did not know what was happening to their parents. And ultimately it took some time even after the war was over to find out what had happened to their, their parents, their siblings, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, their family. Um, and unfortunately in most cases, they found out that their parents had been killed, which is the case with Rita. Rita's parents perish um, in Poland. Um, Christy, is there any other artifacts you have there to share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, I probably just want to touch on, as I mentioned, or as you mentioned also, the Nettlers that, um, you know, took in Rita. She did discover that her parents had been killed probably sometime around 1942 in a ghetto in Poland. Um, and so she ultimately was adopted by the Nettlers. Um, and this is actually a photograph of the Nettlers and their daughter Joyce and then Rita is on the side here um, and so you can see that she's a little bit older in this in this photo so they did they really became her adopted family um, you know she went on to become a nurse uh, and she married and had two children um, obviously Michelle who we've mentioned and Melvin um, and so you know she she really went on to despite the hardships that she'd suffered and you know the horrible trauma of losing your parents at all and let alone losing your parents at such a young age um she was in a way really lucky that she had this wonderful family that did take her in and and she was able to have a really full life the next um kid we're going to talk about is somewhat well known if you are a fan of art specifically from israel um and this is frank meisler um, here are some, the upper two photographs are photos of him as a child. Um, he was born in the free city of Danzig, also Gdansk in Poland. And that's why we oftentimes say that kinder transports did leave what is modern day Poland. The city is now currently in the country of Poland. However, it has a very sort of interesting history as far as who's in control and when, um, but be between 1920 and 1939. So when Frank was born and also when the kinder transports were transpiring, um, it was a semi-autonomous city state. Um, and so there was um, some sort of autonomy within the Jewish community there. Um, it, it before, I mean, so I would say that the region was primarily inhabited by people who traced their roots to Germany at that time, but there was a mixture of many um, different nationalities in the city 
And now um, today it is considered to be part of Poland. Although the, I will also say the common languages are Polish and German and it is it's a mixture of Lutheran and Catholic, but there was certainly a Jewish community that had been living there for a number of years. Um, and so that's where Frank was born. He had a very um, happy childhood. And of course, similar to what we've been mentioning, especially for countries to be border countries to Germany, there were many rumors, many, many stories, um, also many acts of anti-Semitic violence, just because there were people not living directly under the Nazis does not mean that Jewish families close to German borders did not experience random acts of anti-Semitism perpetuated by people affiliated with the Nazi party. Um, so due to the rising danger, um, Frank's parents wanted to get him on a kinder transport. There were only, I think, three kinder transports that left the city. Oh, four, Christy's telling me, only four kinder transports that left the city, so not very many. And Frank was placed on the last kinder transport leaving. Um, he got to England um, in August of 1939, so also right before the war broke out and when all um, borders would be closed. In fact, Nicholas Winton, who I mentioned earlier, had arranged for a kinder transport of over 200 children to leave September of 1939, and it was unable to do so due to the outbreak of the war. Um, so Frank was quite lucky in his timing. He never saw his parents again and later discovered that they were murdered in Auschwitz. Um, his grandmother and two aunts lived in the UK and they took him in and he went on to obtain a degree in architecture and later became a world renowned sculptor. Yeah, so um, we have, it's, it's very heavy uh, and it's actually on loan from Michelle Gold. So as uh, Jordana mentioned, Frank ultimately studied and became an architect when he got to the UK, but he eventually immigrated to Israel and became a very well-known sculptor. And a lot of his work um, is actually depicting Jewish culture and history um, and especially his own experiences as well and the experiences of his youth. So uh, much of his work actually does have themes of the kinder transport um, through it. And he actually, in gratitude to the people um, of Britain and as a reflection of his own experiences, he actually erected five memorial sculptures along the route that the children um, of the kinder transport took to, to get to safety. Um, and then we have actually a small scale it's really heavy. <laughs> um, version of one of the sculptures and it's on loan from Michelle uh, and it's actually titled The Arrival and the original full-size version of this um, is located at Liverpool Street Station in London. So I can't hold it up because it's too heavy so I'm just gonna so you can see it depicts some of the children and it has um, the rail railway so, the rail tracks. Track. Track? Yeah. Um, and in fact, the at the museum, our mezuzah was made by Frank Meisler. And if you have ever been to the, um, old, to the old city of Jaffa, Jaffa in Israel, Frank has a beautiful, um, I mean, he's now passed, but um, there, he had a beautiful gallery and office studio there. And so the next time when travel restrictions are lifted and we are back traveling, I highly recommend looking at some of his artwork there. Um, we, I'm just gonna, sorry, one more thing is, I think that another, in, when we had put together our initial traveling exhibition of the Kinder Transport that Christy had mentioned, it was really important for us to capture stories from all the different places that were impacted um, on the Kinder Transport. And so we searched for stories of individuals who lived in Germany or what is now Poland in um, the free city of Danzig, or Prague, Czech Republic, some, um, we, there were some survivors we focused on from Slovakia, from Austria, just to uh, help visitors and students understand the large context. Um, this was not just a story of German Jews, this was a story of Jews from many different countries where their families had existed for many, many years and generations, and unfortunately experienced this disruption and violence due to um, Hitler and his, his, his aims of taking over Europe and making it um, quote unquote pure according to his pseudoscience and racist beliefs. Um, and so now moving from um, the free city of Danzig, we're gonna go to Vienna and tell the story of Lisa Jura. Yeah, so Lisa uh, was born in Vienna in 1924. 
uh, to parents Abram and Malka Ura. And so uh, she was the middle child of three sisters. So she had an older sister named Rosie and her younger sister, Sonia. Uh, and from an early age, um, Lisa showed a great talent for the piano and it was something that was very dear to her. So she took piano lessons uh, regularly with a teacher. Uh, and in November of 1938, her teacher was actually forced to stop um, tutoring her due to the new ordin ordinances that basically forbade uh, Austrian Jewish students from being taught by non-Jews. Um, and so, I don't know, Jordana, if you want to talk a little bit about that time in Vienna. Yeah, so um, in March of 1938, so before Kristallnacht, uh, the Nazis annexed, Nazi Germany annexed Austria into the country. And um, this was a direct violation of the Versailles Treaty, which specifically stipulated following World War I that Austria and Germany would be two separate countries. Um, however, it did not sort of trigger any sort of response from other countries. Jews had lived in Vienna and the greater Habsburg Empire, which is the Austro-Hungarian Empire for generations, um, for hundreds of years for actually thousands of years because Vienna was originally an encampment part of the ancient Roman Empire and as many history buffs know that um, Jews were enslaved by the Romans and so there are very very old historical um, examples of Jews being around the city Vienna when it was considered Vindoboda under the Romans but um, Following the um, annexation of Austria, the Austrian Jews felt severe pressure and anti-Semitism because in 1938, the Nazis had been in power in Germany for four years, since 1933, five years, since 1933. And they basically took all of the laws that they had implemented in Germany over those years and implemented them very quickly in Austria. And so Austrian Jews felt the intensity of the anti-Semitism that had been brewing in Germany in a very short amount of time. And so then when Kristallnacht struck and um, actually Lisa's father was brutally beaten that evening, it was very, very clear to Austrian Jews that they very much wanted to get out of this country. And there were incredibly long lines trying to get immigration papers, trying to flee, trying to get out. There was a huge refugee crisis caused by Kristallnacht. And so families, again, turned to the kinder transport to know at least they were getting their children out. Um, for Lisa's parents, they were able to secure one spot on the kinder transport and they had three children and ultimately decided that their middle child, Lisa Yura, would take the ticket. Um, she was a piano prodigy at that time, an incredible pianist. And her parents told her to hold onto her music and to find um, some sort of comfort in her music while she was in the UK. Ultimately, her younger sister was also put on a kinder transport um, and sponsored by a Quaker woman who took her in. Uh, Lisa ended up at, in a youth hostel of young Jewish um, teens and kids who worked during the day and lived in basically a foster home um, or an orphanage of sorts. Um, all who had come to the UK on kinder transports uh, because of the intense violence in Europe. And Lisa's daughter, Mona Golubek, wrote a story called The Children of Williston Lane because the youth hostel was on Williston Lane, which is an excellent book um, that's sold at our, uh, at our uh, museum's library. But it, it tells the story of one young refugee girl, Lisa Yura, um, and her holding on to her music and using it as a source of comfort um, during her time in the UK and sort of leaving her parents in the horrors of Kristallnacht. And really it's a true testament to the resiliency of these children. Yeah, so I mean, you can see some of the artifacts that we have as part of the Lisa Yura collection um, that's kindly on loan from Mona, Lisa's daughter at the moment. Uh, and so like we talked about, Lisa was a piano prodigy. So you can see in the middle there, there is a, a record and um, Jordana, I don't know if you want to just stop sharing for a second so we can make it a bit bigger. Um, we have, this is actually on display in the second gallery of the museum where we uh, focus on the story of Lisa Yura, but it's actually a recording that she made uh, when she was actually in the UK of herself playing the piano for her boyfriend at the time, who was also a child at Wilston Lane. Um, and I just wanted to backpedal just a little bit to talk about one particular story related to one of the artifacts that we have. Um, so like Jordana mentioned, Lisa's parents were only able to secure one ticket for the kinder transport, which 
it's, I just can't even imagine as a parent myself, how you would decide between your three children, which one to send to safety. So it's just such a heart wrenching decision uh, in and of itself. Um, but then she took, she, we also know the story of her um, having to say goodbye to her family um, and boarding the train for the kinder transport and, you know, really not knowing if she was ever going to see them again. Uh, and so like Jordana mentioned, um, Lisa's mother's last words to her were that promise me that you'll hold on to your music because she knew how important her music was to Lisa um, and it would be something that would sustain her even though she was going to this foreign country where she didn't know anyone and was going to be all alone. Um, and then while they were on the train platform as well, um, Malka slipped a photo of herself into Lisa's hand um, and we actually have the photo. Um, so this is actually a picture, the picture that Malka gave Lisa as she was leaving. And then there's an inscription on the back um, in German, which says, so you will never forget your mother. And you can actually see the inscription on the back here as well. It's in German, which I'm not going to try and pronounce, um, but the English trans translation is, so you'll never forget your mother. Um, and so she had, this was, you know, one of the only or probably the only photograph that she had of her mother um, at the time that she took with her to the UK. Um, and then also we have an image um, of her father as well, um, which uh, Sonia actually brought with her when she came. So that's a picture of Abram there. So, you know, these, for the two girls, these were some of the only photographs or memories, mementos of their parents that they had um, once they reached the UK. And ultimately, um, you know, Sonia managed to get to the UK as well. As Jordana mentioned, was taken in by a Quaker family. Uh, and also Rosie, their eldest sister also survived and eventually made it to the UK and the family, the three girls were reunited. Um, but unfortunately after the war, they discovered that their parents had been killed. And the hostel in which Lisa lived and she had those two photographs of her parents were her only photographs of them at the time. Um, the hostel was actually damaged in the bomb bombing of London and she was very frantic to figure out if her photographs had survived and indeed they did. Uh, and the story of her older sister, which we won't get too much into, is incredible. The way that her sister actually pretended to be drunk on New Year's Eve to sneak herself onto a train with forgotten papers because she was so toasted. Um, although the entire time sober, this was her plan and was able to get on a train, I think, I believe to Belgium and eventually um, make her way to safety. Um, but after the war, they did learn that their parents um, had perished in the Holocaust. Yeah, and we also have one, there was one more photo that I forgot to mention as well, because we did talk about the children of Wilson Lane and you know, it became an important support network for Elisa um, because she didn't really have, obviously her parents weren't there with her. Um, her sister, Sonia was in the UK, but, you know, wasn't staying with her at the time. So they really, the children of Wilson Lane really became her family. Uh, and this is a very small photo, but it's a photo of the children of Wilson Lane and also of Mrs. Cohen, who was, I guess, the matron of the, the house who took care of the children uh, and really encouraged Lisa to continue with her piano and to practice. Um, and, you know, ultimately she was accepted into the Royal Academy of Music in London um, and was able to, you know, pursue her music that way. I also want to quickly remind everyone that if you have any questions while we're, while we're chatting, feel free to put it in the Q&A. We will have some time at the end um, to go over to the questions, to answer any of them. If you have a question about Kristallnacht or the Kinder Transport or Jewish communities in any of these places, or even the specific stories we're sharing, feel free to ask, drop them into the Q&A um, and we'll get to them. So our next um, story takes us back to Germany, um, which is the story, and actually um, this is another story of the parent of one of our docents at the museum. Um, we really did wanna share stories, both of famous people like Frank Meisler, but of course, um, people who are close to the museum community and active members. So Christy, do you wanna tell us a little bit of what we're looking at and show us some of the photographs you have with you? Yeah, sure. So this, uh page or panel is about Anne Vorheimer. So Anne, as Jordana mentioned, is the mother of uh, Rachel Rubin Green, who is a docent at the museum. Uh, and so we have a collection of her materials. And so Anne was born in 1927 in Coburg, Germany to parents Emil and Bertha Vorheimer. So you're looking at pictures of 
each of those parents the top and bottom images um, with the children. So she was uh, the youngest of three siblings. Uh, and you can see in both of those pictures, in the top picture there, that's Anne's mother with her two brothers and Anne is the baby. And then in the bottom picture, that is um, Anne's father with the three children. Uh, and so after Hitler came to power in uh, 1933, Anne and her two brothers were uh, expelled from public school purely for the fact that they were Jewish uh, and they were forced to attend a school that was solely for Jewish children. So Jordana, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. And so um, as we've mentioned, um, when Hitler, after Hitler came to power um, and the Nazi party came to power in 1933, there was a series of anti-Jewish legislation that began. So they assumed um, power through a democratic coalition in January of 1933. And by April, there were several anti-Jewish laws, including forbidding Jews from being lawyers, practicing as doctors, or being part of the civil um, service. I mentioned that all of the laws in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1938 were implemented very quickly in Austria. And those laws included the removal of Jewish students from school. Um, they were forced to, to attend school with their own, uh, with their own with, uh, for only Jewish kids. And this was in part because there was intense anti-Semitic propaganda being taught in schools throughout Germany, where kids were taught that you know Jews looked a very specific way or behaved a specific way. And the Nazis wanted to continue this isolation in Austria ostracizing the Jewish community. Prussia was the second country in all of Europe to grant emancipation to Jews. Um, so that's Germ Germany originally, Prussia. In the early 19th century, um, the first country was France and with the revolution, with the French Revolution. And the Nazis, when they came to power, really worked hard to um, you know, reverse the decades of emancipation and assimilation for a minority group the German Jews who are less than 1% of the population. Um, I think what's really interesting also in Anne's story is you can see in the left-hand photo, that's Anne and her aunt and their dog in front of the um, Olympic Stadium in Berlin. Um, and yeah, Christy has the actual photo in her hand, so I'll stop my share. So in 1936, the Nazi, Nazi Germany hosted the Olympics in Berlin. Um, there was some movement beforehand for people wanting to boycott the Olympics. Several American athletes indeed boycott the Olympics um, because of the information that was being shared across the globe of the way that um, the Nazi government was treating Jews in Germany. And in fact, um, all of the signs and, and, and sort of all of the anti-Jewish signs that went up. So from 1933 to 1936, there was intense anti-Semitism. There were signs on parks that said, Jews cannot enter parks. There were signs in front of Jewish owned stores, do not buy from Jews. Um, there were signs on benches, Jews cannot sit here. Jews are forbidden over and over and over again. Jews are forbidden in movie houses and public transportation in public parks. Um, and so the Nazis actually removed many of these signs in Berlin in the lead up to the Olympics. Um, because they understood that this would be looked at negatively by the foreign press. Unfortunately, this kind of signaled to many German Jews that maybe things were getting better, um, that they could maybe perhaps remain in Germany because people are incredibly resilient. Um, this ultimately wasn't the case. Um, the Olympics are very well known for a number of different reasons, including Jesse Owens, a Black American runner who broke several world records, won a gold medal, and really challenged um, the Nazis racial hierarchy and sort of racial pseudoscience. Um, so this is a very, I think, interesting photograph because you can see the stadium behind them. And I know, Christy, you have some other photographs from this collection um, that you wanna share. Yeah, so it, interesting um, kind of link, I guess, to what you're talking about with, you know, the, the signs and really the intense propaganda that the Nazis were propagating um, against Jews at this time. So this is actually a picture of um, Anne's parents, Bertha and Emil. And I don't know if you can see, because it's, it's quite a small picture, but this is a picture of them just in, in their neighborhood taken, um, you know, in the, in the 30s after the Nazis had come to power. And you can see that there's the Nazi flag with the swastika in the background, um, just, you know, from a balcony. So it, it definitely was was clear um, and it's interesting to look at that in comparison to what was happening at the time of the Olympics where all of that was really taken down and you know this facade um, had to be put in place to, to uh, because the, the country was going to be on the world stage for the Olympics. 
Um, and then just going back to as well what we were talking about before with the fact that the uh, that Jews were expelled from public school, we actually have an image of the Jewish school class that um, Anne was Anne and her brother were actually in. So this is an image of of the class. So Anne is the one in the front kneeling, and her brother uh, Frank is let's see, one, two, three, third from the right at the back with the glasses. So the, the siblings were in this class of um, Jewish children. Their other elder brother had already been sent away um, to stay with a relative in Texas because they were fearful for his safety, essentially. Um, so yeah, so, so then during Kristallnacht, as Jordana mentioned, Jewish homes and businesses were vandalized and looted. Uh, and the Jewish men of Coburg were rounded up and taken to a school gymnasium um, in the town. And this actually included Anne's father, um, Emil. So Jordana mentioned before that Kristallnacht was, you know, there was a, a, a large number of Jewish men arrested and sent to concentration camps. And Anne's father was actually one of was arrested uh, and sent to Dachau. And so he was from records that uh, Rachel has been able to uncover. He was sent to a prison in a neighboring town for about 10 days and then was deported to Dachau. Um, he was later released uh, and the story around this remains unclear. They're not, the family's not 100% sure how he was able to be released, but he, he eventually was released from Dachau and made his way um, eventually to the UK. So he did manage to escape Germany. Um, like I mentioned before, Anne's oldest brother was actually sent to Texas um, in March of 1938 to stay with family. Um, and then the other brother, Frank, was also sent on a kinder transport um, prior to Anne. So he was sent on a kinder transport in February 1939. And then Anne followed shortly after that in May of 1939. Uh, and so she, Anne, arrived at the station in London. And, um, you know, there's an article that she had written about her experiences and it basically talks about how she waited on the platform and watched as other children were picked up by, you know, fo new foster parents, um, by other family or other officials that were there to claim the children. Um, and soon enough, she was the last child at the station. And then she turned around to be met by her father, which was a complete surprise to her because she hadn't seen him since he'd been arrested that night um, of Kristallnacht. Uh, and so he had made it to England and he was there to be reunited with her and to pick her up. Um, and then Anne's mother, who you can see in this image with the children, um, was able to join the family a short time later in 1939 in the UK. Um, and I, ha I don't have them, the documents here, but the collection contains a large number of the documents and the, 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 just the sheer magnitude of paperwork and things that were needed to be able to immigrate um, is just insanity to me. Like we have a, a few of the documentation, bits and pieces of the documentation that um, Anne's mother was required to, to provide and the hoops that she had to jump through, um, you know, this, she had to have sponsorship and it's a whole another, a story for another time. But, um, but yeah, she was also ultimately able to, to make it to the UK and then the family immigrated together to the US um, in April of 1940 and settled in um, Columbus, Ohio where Emil established a business. And then fortunately as well, other members of their extended family were able to make it um, to the US as well. And, you know, it's to me, like a lot of the stories for the kinder transport that you hear about, it's, it's you know, this the, the ending is so sad in that these children just never saw their parents again. So it's, you know, it's nice to have this story where, you know, this rarity where a family was able to be reunited and all able to make it to safety so it seems like it was such a rare thing at that time. Yeah, there were increasing restrictions on people to both emigrate out of Nazi controlled territory, but also immigrate into other countries. In fact, in response to the refugee crisis, um, over 30 nations gathered in Evian, France for a conference and discussed increasing their quotas because there was a quota system at that time that only allowed a certain number of people from specific groups into the country. and. Um, the US said they would not increase their quotas. Canada did not said they would not increase their quotas. In fact, all of the countries excluding the Dominican Republic refused to ex, um, extend their quotas and made it even increasingly very difficult to fill their quotas 
um, with all these restrictions regarding paperwork and certain things that needed to be filed and stamped and approved by certain dates or people had to start all at the beginning again. Um, and on the flip side, Nazi Germany really was strict in what um, materials you could take um, from Germany. So you were leaving basically all of your possessions and belongings um, behind if you owned a business, a store, it was oftentimes um, Aryanized, which means taken by the Nazis and given um, to a German family for, for less money. Um, okay. And now we are coming to our final story for this evening. Of course, we can't say, tell 10,000 stories, but we hope that each one of these has given you a different insight into the different um, experiences of these children on the kinder transports. Yeah, so Stefan Prager was born in Berlin in 1924 to Ruth and Ernest. Uh, and he was one of two, he had an, one sibling, so it was two, two children. Uh, and both of the children were actually fortunate enough to be able to secure a place on the kinder transport. Uh, and then in October of 1941, they received a letter from their parents in um, Berlin before they were de deported. Um, and so the letter is actually part of the archival collection of the Leo Beck Institute. Um, but on this slide, you actually see a uh, just an excerpt from that letter, which I was reading about. And it's just heart wrenching to hear. Like it was is clear at this time that their parents obviously saw, I feel the writing on the wall, um, just from what are basically saying in the letter. So. Um, their father was saying, never forget your parents who always wanted only everything good for you. And um, from their mother, I hardly know what I should say to you because my heart is so full and words say so little. I've always hoped for a reunion with you, but likely we are now standing before a twist of fate. So it, you know, seemingly they understood the danger that they were facing and, and really felt that they were not going to be reunited with their children. And so we do have a postcard within the collection that relates to this family. Um, and it's kind of an interesting story. Um, Jordana, do you want to touch on it? Because I know you were at the museum when this happened. So several years ago, I think it was about six years ago, the museum received an email from a older gentleman living in Sweden. Um, and he said he was Googling himself, which I guess we should all take some advantage of um, and see what we can find about ourselves on the internet these days. And as many of you know, if you're familiar with the museum, we really do believe in limiting the boundaries between the public and our institution. So whether it's offering all of um, our education programs for free, whether it's being um, before COVID um, open seven days a week or scanning our large 20,000 item um, archival collection and putting it on a virtual platform that is free. Um, these are all things that we do to try to bring Holocaust education and history to every single person with um, internet at this point. Um, and so uh, several years ago, uh, we've of course been launching our online archival platform for, for many, many, many years, but about six years ago, this man, Stefan in Sweden, was Googling himself and came across a postcard that had his name on it. And this is a postcard that when he was a child in Sweden, he mailed to a ghetto in Poland to his parents, never heard from them, did not know if his postcard made it to them, did not know what became of the postcard. Um, it was one of the last ones that he wrote to them. Of course, having heard from his parents in Berlin that they were being deported and that really seeing that by 1941, it was clear that, he, that Jews were facing a threat to their lives. Um, and here we had this postcard, um, which Christy is holding. I'll close it, for, I'll stop the share. And so he reached out to us just to learn about the postcard. And um, it was just so incredible to see the unification or reunification, I should say, of a man older in life um, with a postcard that he wrote to his parents as a teenager, um, just you know, telling them about his day, telling them how much he cared for them and trying to hear of their experiences and if they were all right. Yeah, so the postcard um, is actually part of what's called the Ed Victor collection um, within the museum. So in late 2011, uh, a retired LA lawyer by the name of Ed Victor donated a, a 
sizable collection of materials that related to World War II that he had collected over a period of 30 years. Um, and so the, it just runs a, a, the scope of a whole host of, you know, correspondence and other materials related to World War II from a lot of different people, basically. And the postcard was in amongst that collection. Uh, and so it, the postcard in the postcard, Stefan talks about how he hopes that the mail will reach them. Um, he talks about the fact that it had recently been his birthday. He had just turned 18. Um, he, you know, talks about the various duties that he has at the, on the farm that he was living. So he had been sent um, on the kinder transport. He had been sent to Sweden uh, and it, to, it, to live on a farm in quite a remote area of Sweden that had no running water, um, no electricity, which was obviously quite a culture shock for him coming from Berlin. Uh, and so he talks about that a little, where he's staying, and then also talks about his sister being taken in um, at, in a nearby um, village. And so he obviously, like Jordana mentioned, he never got a reply um, from the letter. Um, and ultimately, his parents were deported to the ghetto. Um, and he essentially, from um, what had happened in the uh, uncovering of the postcard within um, the museum's collection, the archivist at the time that was working at the museum then went to try and do some research into what had happened to his parents um, and contacted the state archives in Lodge uh, and received copies of some of the records. So you can see here the, the record at the bottom there is a handwritten um, Nazi record that records um, Ernst and Ruth's deportation from Berlin um, on October 27th to 29th in 91 um, to the Lodge Ghetto. And then there's also the two records above that relate to the fact um, that Ruth, the mother, who was now a widow, was being moved from the room that she had shared with her husband into a shared room. Uh, and that one was dated May 22nd, 1942. Uh, and then the, the, the final notice there is uh, dated October 13th, 1942. And it indicates that Ruth's room was being vacated because she had died. Um, so yeah, so, you know, this, this whole situation then led to the uncovering of further information about what had happened to Stefan's parents um, and really, you know, answer some questions for him about what had happened to the correspondence that he had tried to send to them too. Yeah, and I mean, just thinking about this postcard from 1942, um, it's already several months after his parents had been deported from Berlin and um, he's just so hopeful in it and hoping that they are well in it. He writes, you know, my beloved parents, I still haven't received a message from you. Um, and so this heartbreaking sense of just not knowing that these teens were going through or these children were going through. Um, and I think what's incredible about two of the stories here is that historical institutions like ours in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum receive donations from collectors and people who are very fascinated by artifacts related to the Holocaust in World War II and then when we start cataloging those and start putting them um, out for the public consumption, people are able to trace their heritage and start to, to learn a little bit more about their families' lives. And that's just an incredible opportunity of what primary sources can offer and what sort of open spaces and open dialogue and barrier-free archives can create and facilitate for a man 74 years after he wrote this postcard to, to learn of its um, not only the fact that it is there, um, but the fact that it is being used by a historic institution, both to commemorate people like his parents and educate future generations on um, acts of resistance like the kinder transport. Um, it's a story that, you know, really honors the past while looks towards the future and is part of the mission of the museum to both commemorate, educate and inspire. And so we wanted to end on this. Um, just to keep that in mind and thinking about how primary sources and oral history are so, so vital to our community um, and how institutions like ours are so vital, vital to the community, not just of Los Angeles, but all the way to Sweden um, and beyond. So thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Um, we are now open to questions. Um, if you have any questions to Christy, to myself, about any of the topics we talked about, um, let's see. Um, but, 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 but did Stefan indicate about his life and that of his sister after the war? I know that he remained um, in Sweden for the remainder of his life. I actually can't remember if his sister remained as well. Um, Christy, do you remember hearing anything about his sister? 
I'm not sure. To be honest, the, the, the things that I had read was that he remained in Sweden because he definitely contacted the museum. When he contacted the museum, he was still in Sweden. I'm not too sure about his sister, to be honest. Um, I believe there was actually, when this happened, it was in 2015. So nearly six years or five and a half years ago. Um, I want to say that there was an article in the Jewish Journal that was specifically about um, this unification of artifact and um, survivor. Um, and that might hold more information um, on the, what happened to his sister, but he continued living in Sweden for the remainder of his life. Um, any other questions from the aud um, audience? So Christy, I know we tend to oftentimes focus on some of your favorite collections at the museum. And so I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you what was your favorite um, part of this Kinder Transport collection? Um, I, I, I mean, I don't wanna say favorite because I they're all my favorites, but I definitely, like we mentioned before, I think, um, this topic is very close to my heart because we have a traveling exhibit about this. And actually it was the first exhibit that I worked on when I started at the museum. Um, so it was really kind of, you know, obviously I have some, a degree that relates to the Holocaust and history, but this was really like my introduction to the museum. So it's definitely holds a special place in my heart. Um, I really enjoyed looking at Anne Forheimer's story just because it was one that I hadn't necessarily looked into in any great detail. Um, and there's a lot of documents and photographs, like I mentioned, and a lot of different facets of the story um, that was really interesting. And to see, you know, um, what happened to the family and the fact that they were able to all ultimately make it out and immigrate together to the US, um, you know, it has a nice ending to the story too. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's another, I think, really special part of tonight's talk is that it features people who we know personally and just thinking about these incredible, dedicated individuals like Michelle, um, like to think that she has been a docent at the museum for over 12 years and really as a dedication to her mother. Um, also to think about Rachel Rubin Green, who also has been a docent at the museum for a number of years and that these are the stories of their mother. And if, you know, people didn't, act during um, the Holocaust and really step up to try and assist in the rescue of these refugee children. Um, these women who worked so hard to inspire a new generation of leaders, I mean, they are here because of that. Um, so I think that's just such an incredible um, piece of this. But, you know, there's still very many undiscovered stories. I encourage all of you to search for that. And we're really, really grateful that you guys joined today. Um, and how many children were saved? There were about 10,000 children who were saved um, on the kinder transport. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we hope you have a great and safe evening um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.